from Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And in this chapter, John saw our Lord. He was clothed down to his feet. He had in his right hand the seven stars, the ministers of the churches. He was in the midst of the lampstands, the candlesticks, the churches. Verse 17, John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Today, may we be humbled as John was before our Lord, but may we also hear the Lord saying to us, Fear not, that on the basis of his death and resurrection, we have access to him. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. We'll seek our Lord's face together, please, in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for the return of thy day. We thank thee for a day set aside for worship. And we pray today that the help of God will be granted. As we spend this time in thy house, we pray that we will know the Lord come near. Grant us help to worship thee aright. As we think of our Saviour, crucified yet risen, triumphant and descended. O oh Lord, we rejoice that he lives to die no more. Help us in our worship, then we pray in our Lord's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn in our hymn books, please, to the Psalm 139, the front section of the hymn book. And it's the second version of the psalm that we're singing. It's on the page 129. The page numbers are on the bottom of the ages. So it's, Lord, thou hast searched me, and hast known my rising up and lying down, and from afar thy searching eye beholds my thoughts and the secret life. So it's Psalm 139, the second version, is on the right hand side of page 129, and we're singing the words that we have here on this page down to the end of verse 6.
Let's take the Lord's face together, please, in prayer. Let us look to the Lord for his saving help in this meeting. Our gracious Father, we thank thee that thou knowest all about us. Thou art the omniscient God. We thank thee that every detail of thy creation is known to thee. What a blessing to thy people to know that every detail of our lives is known to thee. Dear Lord, what a comfort it is to know that in our lives God is working all things for our good. For our God's great glory. Well, we give thee thanks today that the one who is omniscient is also omnipotent. Well, Lord, we thank thee that all power is our God's. No, Lord, we thank thee that that power is not only demonstrated in the unusual, but in the daily unfolding providence. God's special care over his people. Today, we lift up our hearts in worship that this God is our God. That every redeemed one in the meeting today can rejoice that on account of God's grace, we have been brought into union with Christ. Oh Lord, we pray today that in this meeting that we will truly sit at thy feet, that today we will be taught of thee, that today we will hear the Lord's voice ministering to us, that we will be instructed in the ways of righteousness, that we will be led on in progression and holiness that today through the word that is read and preached that we will be more conformed to the blessed image of Christ. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that you will not only minister today to the converted, but O oh Lord, speak today to those that are still lost, to those that are still without Christ, Open blinded eyes, we ask. We cry to thee that we will see lost ones be drawn savingly unto thyself. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that thou will be pleased to deliver those that are lost from a wasted life to a lost eternity. O oh Lord, may there be those today that are wakened up and give us a heart, we pray, for the lost all around us. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that we will see the Lord work in the hearts of our loved ones that are not converted, in the hearts of those round about us here where we live, in our workplaces. We cry to thee that we will see the lost being drawn to our Saviour, counted in to the number of the saved of the Lord. O oh Lord, we cry to thee today that you will come and work in every family. We pray especially for our children and young people as they return to education this week. We pray for thy preserving hand to be upon them. O oh Lord, we pray that they will not only know success academically, socially, but, O oh Lord, we pray that each one of our children and young people will be truly converted and walking in the ways of the Lord. Preserve them from the things of this world, we pray. O oh Lord, we pray that their desires will be after the things of Christ. O oh Lord, we do pray that you will move them 
in our company here today. We remember every faithful witness across this uh, this lady land. We pray very especially for our sister congregations. Minister there, we pray. And, oh Lord, we ask that as the word of God is preached, that there will be there also no signs following the preaching of the word. So Lord, we pray that every part of the meeting today will have the blessing of God upon it. Do us good in thy presence. Forgive us of our sins, we pray. Cleanse us afresh. We're going to turn again in our hymn books, please, to the words of the hymn 130. The hymn 130. Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears. The leading sacrifice in thy behalf appears. 130. And we'll stand as we sing these words, and then after we sing these words, the Brother Bevis is going to come. Some of it is hard for you. Your child to understand, please bear with me. 
I'd like to read a couple of verses from Exodus uh, chapter 2. Reading about Moses. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, and we read in the book of Acts that grown means he was 40 years old at the time, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. We know that uh, Moses from his childhood was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. Initially as a little baby, she gave him back to his mother to look after. Uh, but not long after that, he went and was raised uh, in the palace by Pharaoh's daughter. In fact, it was Pharaoh's daughter who named him Moses. His own mother didn't have that privilege to, to name him. Uh, but from a young age, uh, the young boy knew that he was not an Egyptian. He knew that he was a Hebrew. And so, remember when we read Exodus, it is Moses writing, and he uses the word brethren more than once to speak of the Hebrews. They were his brethren. <coughs> Or be born a Hebrew. And from a young age, God put in his heart a love for his brethren. It's hard for us to imagine, but while he was living in the palace, you know, wherever the capital of Egypt was then, with all the uh, pomp and the wealth that there was in the palace, his heart ached for his brethren. He saw their suffering, he saw them being beaten and abused uh, by their slave owners, and it troubled him deeply. And so at the age of 40, so Stephen says in the book of Acts that it was at 40, that he went out one day and he could bear it no longer. He saw one of his brethren being beaten by one of the, the Egyptian slave masters. And it says he looked to see if anyone would see him. And when he saw that they were alone, he killed the Egyptian. And he hid him or buried him in a shallow grave in the sand. No doubt he hoped that no one had seen and that no one would say anything. But one thing we find out in our own life with God is that God does not cover up our sin. The only way he covers our sin is when we bring it to him in repentance and he covers it with the blood of our Savior, his dear Son. But other than that, God does not cover sin. He doesn't hide it. You may think there are some things that you can do that your mom and dad won't notice. But it is not hidden. And so in a very short time it becomes clear that what Moses has done is known. It's known not just to the Hebrews, it's known even right up to the top, to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh wants to kill him. And Moses has to flee for his life and leave, leave Egypt. There's often a history of violence within religion. You will know that in Islam, it is no shame for an Islamic man to kill a non-believer. They have the sanction of their Quran to say, kill the infidel, slay the unbeliever. And you know that in a lot of cults, there's a domination, there's a control and a violence done to the will of people. It would be nice to say that within the Christian church, there is no such thing as violence. But unfortunately, as we look back on the history of the New Testament church, there has been violence, even within the professing Christian church. What I must say is that in almost every case where there is violence done in the name of the Lord Jesus, it is the Pope and the Roman Church behind it. So whether we talk of the Crusades or the Inquisitions that happened so terribly in Spain, uh, whether we think of the Thirty Year War in the 1600s, or the Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572 in France, always we find the Roman Catholic Church behind a dominating type of force religion. And when a church uses force and violence, and even intimidation and threat, they show that they are not a true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the gentle Lamb of God, and the church is called to follow in his steps. Young people, there are two kingdoms. 
So there is an earthly kingdom that reigns and rules over our bodies. And there is a heavenly kingdom that rules over our souls. And although many people might not commonly believe it, the heavenly kingdom rules over the earthly kingdom. When the Lord Jesus Christ was brought before Pontius Pilate, Pilate asked him if he is a king. He said to him, My kingdom is not of this earth. And he says, To prove it, if my kingdom were of this earth, my followers would fight for me. And we remember that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter drew out his sword. When he saw that they were going to capture Jesus by force, he drew out his sword and cut off one of the servant's ears. And as soon as he drew out his sword, the Lord Jesus said to him, Put up thy sword, Peter. Those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Those who sow violence will reap violence. In other words, the Lord Jesus was saying, that is not my kingdom. It's not a kingdom of force and violence. This was something that Moses had to learn. For the next 40 years, we read very little about Moses, except that he is humbled as a shepherd on what he describes as the backside of the desert. He's living in obscurity, looking after his father-in-law's sheep. And perhaps that's what it took for Moses to learn, <coughs> that God does not call us to use violence in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. At 80, God calls Moses again to go and fight for the deliverance of his people. But how is he to fight? He says to Moses, go and speak to Pharaoh. You would think, well, that's not going to work. A man with no connections, no title, no prestige is going to speak to the most powerful man on earth and tell him to let the people go. Yet that is Moses' commission. Go and speak. Young people, you may wonder why do we come to church every week and so much of church is taken up in speaking and preaching. Well, that is God's ordained means of grace. That by the preaching of the gospel, and people's hearts will be brought to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the way that God works. To some they will call it foolish, this preaching, but not so to them who believe. It is the way God works in our hearts and our lives. And there was a day of violence. <coughs> there was a day when a mighty battle was fought for your soul and mine. But the Lord Jesus Christ fought that battle alone. He had no help, physical help, from men on that day. He fought it alone. And his calling to his people is to go spread the gospel, to tell others about his gentle love for lost sinners like Let us pray. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the gentle and the meek Lamb of God. We thank you, Lord, that he is not ashamed call us his brethren, although we are sinful, though we have done nothing to help in our own redemption, he calls us his brethren, if we believe in him. I pray for the young people here today. I pray that you would protect them from all violence, and not just physical violence, but violence done to their wills, to force them to think and act in a certain way to conform. Oh Lord, may they hear the gospel. May they know the Lord Jesus for themselves and the sweet liberty that we have in him. Lord, I pray that you would save each one and draw them to your dear son. We ask in Jesus' name. Thank you, Mavis. Before we come to the offering hymn, we'll have the reading of the scriptures. We have your Bibles, please. We have copy of God's Word with you to Exodus chapter 17, Exodus and the chapter 17, and in this chapter the children of Israel were engaged in battle with the Amalekites, they had come to oppose the children of Israel, but we read in Moses' prayer for victory. Exodus 17, verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. The 
came to pass when the people were sorry when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there on. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, the one on the one side, and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, called the name of it Jehovah Nissan, for he said, Behold, the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Then we'll turn, please, to the New Testament, the Gospel according to John, and the chapter 14. John chapter 14. And the Lord is here in the upper room. John 14, and verse 15. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, or another helper, another advocate, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, or I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while of the world saith me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. And that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him. We will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me, sorry, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. The word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And we'll end there. The Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. We're going to turn in our hymn books, please, to the hymn 634. 634. As we sing these words, the offering will be received. If you didn't come prepared for an offering, please just let the bag pass by. 634. What various hindrances we meet in coming to the mercy seat. Six, three, four, remaining seated.
to turn God's word to Romans chapter 8, please. Romans and the chapter 8. We've been going through the book of Romans for some time. We're usually seeking to take a number of verses together, but in Romans chapter 8, but a few times we've had to slow down. And we're doing that again this morning. We're just taking another two verses. Romans chapter 8 and the verses 26 and 27. Romans 8, 26 and 27. We were singing there about hindrances in coming to the mercy seat. And Paul here describes in particular one of these hindrances. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself, for the Spirit himself, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We will seek our Lord's face together, please, in prayer. And let us look to the Lord for his help as we come and meditate upon his truth. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for all that we have heard already today. We thank thee for the peace in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we thank thee for that effectual operation of the Holy Spirit within the hearts of men and women, drawing them to thyself, and for the absolute transformation that a sinner that long resisted now comes to life. Oh Lord, we pray for the operation of the Spirit as we come now and meditate upon thy truth. Now, even as we think over this particular work of the Holy Spirit grant us help to understand. And Lord, we pray that we will live in the enjoyment of the comfort that Paul is giving here for any in our gathering still lost. Oh Lord, we pray that they will see their great lack to they will be drawn to thyself. Grant that needed help we do pray. The help of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Charles Dickens, the famous novelist, said, No one is useless in this world who lightens the burdens of another. No one is useless who lightens the burdens of another. <laughs> Now Dickens, of course, as he wrote those words, was speaking from a secular point of view. And yet as Christians we can identify that it's absolutely true. That we are to bear the burdens of others. Galatians 6 verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. And I think then we can easily understand Martha when she came to the Lord when Jesus was in her home. And she was saying, I ask Mary to come to help me. Tell Mary to help me with this kitchen work. Now we know that Martha had got things out of proportion. And we know that it was Mary that had chosen the good part. And yet, so I think we can understand, Mark, that when she was so preoccupied with the work of the kitchen, that she felt it was difficult to do it alone. She wanted someone to come and share that burden. And when she said, bid Mary come and help, she wasn't saying, tell Mary to come so that I can go and sit down. But the particular word that she used shows that she meant that Mary would come 
and assist. Martha would continue with the work in the kitchen, but Mary would be there to help. It's interesting that that same word that Martha used for help is the word that Paul uses concerning the help that the Holy Spirit gives to the child of God in prayer. Romans 8, 26. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. And the word is showing us the Holy Spirit does not come to take over. The Holy Spirit does not come and say to the Christian, if you're struggling in prayer, just give up on it. Do you have a rest? I will pray instead for you. No. The Holy Spirit helps so that we would keep on praying. That we would be assisted. The word has the idea of helping with a burden. And so this word brings out the idea that the Christian in prayer often feels that he's carrying a burden. And Paul says here is comfort. The Holy Spirit comes to help bear the burden. He helps to come and take the weight. But as I say, he is not saying stop praying. But rather, he enables us to keep on praying. Imagine if you said to a young child, lift that chair. And you know that the child cannot lift that chair alone. But the child seeks to, you come along and you help, you lift the, 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 the chair. And maybe the child's response is to let go, but you want to encourage them. You say, you, you keep helping, you keep lifting. In all reality, you're the one that's bearing the burden. The child is still holding on. And uh, this is the image then of prayer. The Holy Spirit is there to assist. He carries the burden, but we are to hold on in prayer. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that John Murray said that there are three main points of encouragement in the latter part of Romans 8. Now, first of all, the disproportion between our sufferings and the glory that is to fall. Now, our sufferings in this life, in this life, seem great, but actually, they're small in comparison with the great glory that is to follow. Then there is this area where the Holy Spirit comes to help in our infirmities. And then thirdly, all things work for our good. And the second one of these then we want to look at today, the Holy Spirit sustaining us in our infirmity. The Holy Spirit helping us in prayer. Now remember, the whole theme of this chapter is no condemnation. The believer is secure in Jesus Christ. But Paul understands when he says to the Christian, you are secure, you're not condemned. That some Christians will say, well, if that is the case, why am I experiencing this? Why do I feel like this? And in this example, if I am really secure in Christ, if it's true I'm not condemned, why am I struggling in prayer? If I'm truly secure, how is it that sometimes when I come to pray, I don't even know the right words to say? Paul, in fact, says, you feel like that? So do I. Paul is saying, there are times I come to pray, I do not know what to pray, what are the right words to say. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. This is the experience of the Christian in this life. And so Paul is saying, this is not an argument against no condemnation but rather seeing that we are not condemned. For those that are truly not condemned, if we see that we are not condemned, that truth is a comfort to me in this crisis of prayer. And I see because I am not condemned, the Holy Spirit has not abandoned me. 
Rather, he comes to help me in prayer that I might continue. And so I want us then to consider together the burden and the bearer in prayer. The burden and the bearer in prayer. I want to say, first of all, the burden of the saved. The burden of the saved. And Paul takes one aspect of our infirmity, infirmity of prayer. And then he takes one very particular aspect of our infirmity in prayer, this the struggle as far as the, the words is concerned. Now the words could be translated here, and it's not good English, that's why it's not translated that way. We know not the what we should pray for. We know not the what we should pray for. And it is bringing out this idea that we know we should pray. And even over a particular matter, we know we should pray something. But we don't know what words should be used. Now Paul, as he speaks of this struggle, he is using it as one illustration, I believe, of struggle. So the Christian struggles in reading the scriptures. I think Paul is saying the Holy Spirit comes to help us. And the Christian struggles in, struggles in witnessing to the lost. The Holy Spirit is there to help us in our infirmity. I, I struggle in my battle with sin. The Holy Spirit is here to help me in, in my struggle. But since this is the example that Paul is setting forth, it's the example then that we want to think about. If you think, for example, if you have a loved one that's very ill, and perhaps this is someone that is advanced in years and you certainly want to pray about it and you know you must pray about it but what am I to pray is it really God's will that he will heal my loved one yes I would love that their life would be spared but maybe that's not the will of God so what is my request and you come and you're really just crying on to the Lord or maybe it's a wayward child. And we know we want to see them saved or we want to see them restored. But what if the Lord is going to humble them first? What if your wayward one must have the experience of the prodigal? He must be brought as it were to the pig's side. And you come and you pray for this loved one in prayer and you're agonizing over it. You don't want them to have to go through that. And yet you understand that maybe they will have to. But you struggle, how can I pray? Or maybe it's in some area of dispute in life and you hold a particular view in the matter. And yet before the Lord, you recognize, I just can't pray, Lord, may my side is where I win. So how can I pray? Here is our infirmity. Now why do we have this struggle? Why do we have this infirmity? Sometimes it's because of our ignorance. <coughs> we do not have full sight. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, now we see through at last, darkly. And understand that there are different views over the meaning of that particular text. But some think that what Paul is saying is that in the time prior to the completion of the canon, that God's people had limited vision. But there would be perfect vision with the completion of the canon. I find that to be attractive, but I don't think that's what Paul is actually saying. Rather, the view of the old writers is that the imperfect sight is this present time. We do not yet see face to face. There are many questions, many perplexities, many things that we do not yet understand. We don't even know what's best for ourselves. And so we know not what to pray for as we ought. 
or the problem could be our unbelief. We come to pray, and again, we're praying over a particular scenario. And maybe we would say, well, I would love to pray this, but could the Lord really answer in that way? And we're like that man then when the Lord came down to the Mount of Transfiguration. We're crying, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief. Maybe our problem is weariness, coldness. We have strayed from our first love. Or maybe it's lack of acquaintance with the Word of God. Aren't there times that we have prayed amiss because we have been ignorant of some truth that's clearly set forth in the Word of God? We don't know enough of the Bible. Therefore, we don't know enough of the will of God. Or maybe we're praying according to our own lusts, our own desires. We pray over a particular scenario in a particular way because we want things to get better for ourselves. Paul knew that feeling. Remember how he prayed three times that the Lord would remove the thorn from the flesh. And the Lord said to him, No, Paul, but stay, but my grace is sufficient. And we would like to pray that our problems would all go away. We're prone to selfish prayers. Or maybe prayers even motivated by pride. Remember James and John asked for that place of primacy in the kingdom to come? We want what to pray as we always. And dear Christian, Paul then is really saying here, you have a prayer. Acknowledge it to be so. But don't let that infirmity stop you praying. These words are not recorded as a discharge from the place of prayer. But sadly, sometimes when people come to an understanding of the doctrines of grace, they get things distorted. And they begin to come to the conclusion, well, if God has ordered all things, if God's great decree determines all that is going to happen why should I pray the Lord said men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to give up it's God's will for us to pray Thomas Watson talked about the angel fetching Peter out of prison but he said it was prayer that fetched the angel now some might say, well, was it not always God's will that the angel would be fetched? Of course it was. But God had also decreed that his people would pray that the angel would be sent. Prayer is part of God's decree. And so then the sovereignty of God does not excuse prayerlessness. Rather we are to see God has ordained that we would pray. And as I've said then, this word help means we're to persist in prayer. And Paul says in verse 27 that the Holy Spirit, towards the end of verse 27, the Holy Spirit maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now we'll come back to this intercession in a moment or two. But I want you to see that what Paul is talking about in verses 26 and 27 is for the saints. The saints are not those that have lived a very distinct life and have gone to heaven. The church has said, I'm going to reward him or her with sainthood. The saints are every true believer. If you're a true believer, if you're not under condemnation, if you're justified by God's grace, then you're a saint. And this help is for the saints. It reminds us that 
that the Lord hears the prayers of the convergence. So often, God's people can be exhorting the unconverted to pray. It's not something you find in the Word of God. We certainly do exhort them, we appeal to them to cry unto God for mercy. But in this, or in these two verses, they're not included. They're not the saints that are struggling in prayer. And it really brings us back then to Paul's point earlier in the chapter, chapter 8, verse 9. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. And the one who's not yet born again, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. And in his infirmity, he doesn't have one to help. And Paul really is saying to those that are not converted, you need to see your lack. That what the Christian has, you do not have. And you won't have it until the Holy Spirit is in you. God's command then to you is repent. Believe the gospel. Come to the Lord for mercy. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, it's not a peace. So we've seen here the burden of the saints. So I want to see then, secondly, the bearing of the Spirit. This support that the Holy Spirit gives to the Christian. And the Christian then in these verses is to say, I am weak. And I need the Lord's help. I try to take hold of God, but praise God, the Holy Spirit takes hold of me. And how does the Holy Spirit help with these groanings? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know, no, we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself, make an intercession for us. Now what are these groanings? Before I try to explain what they are, I'm going to say what they are not. For there are some that take these words in Romans 8, 26 to teach tongue speaking. And now tongues are not mentioned in these verses nor are they in view. And the reason why some claim this is tongues is because of a current day practice. You see, tongues as they were practiced in the Bible were as a sign to the unbelief. They were used in public gatherings as a sign to the unbeliever. But today, Tongues, and I don't believe it's true, biblical tongues, but tongues are used in private. The tongues are used when no believer is present. And so those that advocate tongues in our time have a great problem. If tongues are assigned to the unbeliever, and in particular, as 1 Corinthians tells, is assigned to the unbelieving Jew, then how can they explain this tongue speaking in private or tongue speaking without unbelievers present. And so what they do then is they take this verse to hang their practice on. I need to find somewhere in the Bible. And so this is the verse that they take, even though it's nothing to do with tongues at all. And their practice then in relating it to this text is what we call eisegesis, not exegesis. That is, they're reading something into the text that is not there rather than explaining what the text actually means. And out of this then comes sometimes very bizarre teaching uh, advocated by those that speak in tongues. And not everyone that speaks in tongues will carry all of this, but some do. Some will say that when they're speaking in this prayer language, in tongues, that it's only God that understands so much so that even the devil doesn't understand. And so they will say to us that they seek to pray in understandable words. The devil knows what you're praying. My prayer is superior, the devil doesn't know. 
You'll not find that anywhere in the Bible. Now they claim it's found in these two verses, but you'll search for a long time before you see it. If Paul had meant tongues, he would have said it. Romans chapter 8 is not a riddle. And a riddle that wasn't solved until the rise of Pentecostalism, no. Also in Romans chapter 8, as we've seen in previous messages, Paul has talked about the groaning of creation. And the tongue speaker is going to be consistent. In verse 26, is teaching that the groaning is tongue speaking, then creation around us is speaking in tongues. It's the only consistent way to live the chapter. It makes a nonsense of the chapter. So the question is then, what are these groanings? Or who is doing the groanings? The groanings are our groanings. But they're a result of the Holy Spirit's work in us. And so it says, the Spirit itself, the Spirit himself, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Or groanings without words. Now the groanings here are given to us by the Holy Spirit. But it's not that the Holy Spirit has to grow. It's not that the Holy Spirit doesn't know what the words would be. Remember in Galatians 4 verse 6, it says, God has sent the Spirit of the Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now the Holy Spirit is personal cry, is not Abba, Father. But he has put that cry into our hearts. And so it is here. The groans are not the personal groans of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit has put them into our hearts. We groan. And the Holy Spirit then makes effective and effectual intercession for us. And that word intercession has the idea of him praying on our behalf. And so we are groaning. Our prayer at times may be little more than a cry. And yet the Holy Spirit perfects it. Where the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. And as we read here, according to the will of God. And the words then of these two verses correspond so clearly to what the Lord was teaching in the upper room. We read earlier in John chapter 14. I pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. He'll give you an advocate. Or the word is the idea someone who will draw alongside you. And this is what happens then in our prayer struggle. The Holy Spirit comes alongside us. He is this Comforter, He is this advocate. That same word is used in the New Testament of Christ. Jesus Christ is our advocate in heaven. And today, Jesus Christ then pleads before the throne. We have an advocate in heaven. Jesus Christ the righteous. But then Paul says here, we also have an advocate in our hearts. The Holy Spirit comes near. A.W. Pink explains this beautifully in his commentary in Exodus, where in Exodus 17, Moses was in the mountain praying. And so we read the words earlier. And Moses, as he was praying, when his hands were up, the children of Israel were gaining victory. But then in weariness, his hands would hang down. And the Amalekites were getting the upper hand over the Israelites. So Aaron and her came. Moses sat on a rock. He sat on a stone. Surely it speaks of our position in Christ. As we pray, we are seated in Christ. But Moses had two helpers then. On one side... Aaron held up his hand. On the other side, 
Her held up his arm and think argue said that the child of God today has two helpers in prayer. We have our heavenly Aaron, our heavenly high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. Today when you come to pray, you have no right in yourself to pray. But the way is opened up through our high priest. And praise God, not only does he help us, but he intercedes for us in glory. But then he argues that her speaks of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is where is holding up our honor. He's there to assist us in our prayer. And we can see then the operation of the Trinity. That Christ appears before the Father pleading on our behalf. The Holy Spirit is making this intercession according to the will of God. And the Father You think of the Romans that Paul was addressing here. <clears throat> there was the threat of violence that we heard of earlier. Now, among the congregation, uh, undoubtedly there was that question, will we be cast to the lions? Perhaps as they came to pray, they knew not how to pray. They it was their infirmity. But Paul says the Holy Spirit is there to help you. And maybe in your life you have lost out of joy. And you come to pray about it, but you don't know how to pray to God. The Holy Spirit comes, He makes intercession. Uh, at times then, your life hand. Remember how she came to pray for a son. That was certainly her desire. She could frame that much. Remember how her lips moved, but no words actually came out. I believe Hannah was one that was filled with the Holy Spirit. and weakness. Great assistance was given. She prayed in accordance with the will of God and her prayer was answered. Surely then as we take these two verses they correspond with what I've chosen as the modern text for this year. That God, God does exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. We come to pray in weakness. But God will answer beyond our asking. Because of this help in prayer. We see surely also here the Lord's pity. The Lord does not cast you off and abandon you because of your difficulty in prayer. But rather he says I've come here to help. Surely we also learn here. Never to rest on our own strength. Never rest on our own strength. Now, aren't there times that we have a particular problem and we recognize for this particular dilemma I can't rest on my own strength and so I need to pray about it. And Paul says you even need the Lord's help in the prayer about it as well. In every detail. It's not only that particular difficulty, but even when you pray, you need the Lord's help. We are utterly in need of the Spirit's assistance. I close with the thought that the greatest agony in prayer was not that of Hannah, though that was a great agony. The greatest agony in prayer was not those of the Roman saints as they agonized over the threat of persecution. The greatest agony of prayer in history is our Lord Jesus in the garden. And in his humanity, he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. 
he saw the, the cup of the fierce wrath of God. If it's possible, let it pass. It was a great struggle. And he said, not my will, but thy will be done. Praise God, that prayer was heard. That prayer was answered. The will of God was done. The cup of wrath was not taken away. Christ drank it in all of its fierceness. So that the cup of wrath against you would be taken away. one of the meetings today and you're still unconverted, the drink that you deserve is that cup of wrath. And you deserve it for all eternity. Christ agonized in the garden. He was obedient unto the will of the Father. He took that cup. The way to God is opened up for a sinner like you. And today, if you're here without Christ, I exhort you then come to Him. Come to Him for mercy. May you have the Spirit in it. May the Lord take His word. So we'll buy together, please. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for your help today. Oh Lord, we thank thee that in prayer the struggling saints are helped. <coughs> Oh Lord, we confess that we have many a time felt like this. We do not know how to praise the Lord. We thank thee that the Spirit is there to help. And yea, Lord, we struggle even in coming to pray. We struggle to get our priorities right. We thank thee for the comfort of this verse, the Holy Spirit. Oh, help us, we do pray. Leave us not to our own devices. I pray that we continually will know that to the divine assistance. For any in the gathering unsaved, draw them to thyself, we pray. Save their never dying souls. We pray that you bless our time of fellowship. Thank thee for the food that has been provided. Bless that to our bodily use. And may it take us all to our homes in safety. May God's blessing abide upon us through this thy day. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior, in glory and majesty, dominion and power.